Okay, so let me first of all say that I really very much appreciate the effort that the organizers and also that IHES have gone have put into uh, converting this event into a virtual format. We all know that this is not the the style of event that we were hoping for, that we were that we were wishing for. But I think it's really important that all of us at, at all levels of our society under these circumstances do the best with this with in the, in the circumstances that we have even if those uh those efforts are not ideal okay so um let's go ahead and get to work so i'm going to talk over the uh, next uh three hours about stable homotopy groups okay so um let me begin with some background okay um mostly classical right about the stable homotopy groups and why these are things that we should care about computing. Okay, so what? Um, so so S naught, right? This is the name of the unit object in the stable homotopy category. Okay, and it's it's the unit object in the sense that if you smash any any spectrum X with S naught, you just get X back again. Okay, so it's the it's the unit of that object, and the stable homotopy groups are basically by definition they are the graded endomorphisms of S naught. They're the graded endomorphisms of the unit object. That's what we're talking about, right? And as we know from many examples, the endomorphisms of the unit object control the structure of the entire category, right? So these pi star actions, these actions by the endomorphisms um, have a lot to do with the structure of the entire category. Okay, so for one very concrete example, we could think about um, the, the class of two cell complexes. So two cell complexes, are the of the spectra that you get by taking a sphere, a, a sphere spectrum, mapping it to another sphere spectrum, and then taking the cofiber. Okay, and then the the, the uh, and then this SK right, that's the shift of this this uh, this one to begin with, right? Okay, so um, so these these two cell complexes X, of course, they're in correspondence with the elements of pi star, right? There's this map that you took the cofiber of to get X, right? So if you want to um, classify two cell complexes, you have to compute the stable homotopy groups. Okay, so that's one sort of like very naive way in which um, these sort of pi star, uh, the, these elements of pi star tell you about the whole, about the other parts of the category. Okay, and so you might want to take this example of two cell complexes and extend it further, right? So what about, um, and so in gen, and in general, finite cell complexes are very much related to the structure of pi star, okay? But in a more complicated way. Okay, in a more sophisticated way. So let's take a look at, as for an example of that, let's take a look at a three cell complex. So I've drawn a picture over here on the left, which is sort of a schematic of what I want to do, right? So I want to have um, a, I want to build a complex, right? And it should have S mod beta, it should have the two cell complex associated to beta as a sub complex at the bottom, okay? And it should have the two cell complex associated to alpha as a quotient. Okay, at the top, right? That's what this picture means, sort of schematically. Okay, um, and so you can do this um, sometimes. Sometimes you can build a three-cell complex um, where the bottom two cells are S mod beta and the top two cells are S mod alpha. However, it turns out there's an obstruction. You need a condition. Okay, and that condition is that you need the product alpha times beta or the composition alpha times beta as endomorphisms of S naught, an endomorphism of the unit object, that composition needs to be zero, okay? That turns out to be an obstruction to constructing such a three cell complex, okay? And then you could go further, right, from this three cell complex and you could ask about, well, what about a four cell complex? So a four cell complex, so the schematic looks, is, is like this picture I've got over here on the left, Okay. And again, the idea is that we're building a four cell complex. It should have a certain three cell complex as a, three, as a sub complex and a certain other three cell complex as a quotient, right? And so, and those quotients should be alpha, beta, and gamma, okay? So we already know from the previous example that you have to have that alpha, beta is zero in, um, in order for that top three cell complex to exist. And we also know that beta times gamma has to be zero for that bottom C th three cell complex to exist. Okay, and then it turns out there's an additional obstruction. There's another obstruction to actually putting all of these things together into a single four cell complex. And that has to do with the tota bracket alpha comma beta comma gamma. Okay, you need this tota bracket to vanish or at least to contain zero. Okay, so I haven't told you what a tota bracket is. Okay, and we will get in, later in these talks, we will get into a little bit of this sort of these sort of higher operations, this higher structure that, uh, that one needs 
to uh, to study here. Okay, but I but we won't be probably too precise about that. The, the point I want to emphasize here is that there's higher structure that you need to know about to solve sort of real tangible problems. Okay, and then you can try to take this sort of cell complex idea to an extreme, right? And maybe now I've looked at some what you know. Uh, uh, you know, a sort of a very, a much more complicated type of cell diagram, whatever this even means, right? Um, and you could ask whether you can form an, a cell complex of this type over here on the right. And then it turns out, you know, um, there are some obstructions, right? What are the obstructions? Well, um, you know, to constructing this thing. Um, and it turns out that there are, but they involve something that maybe you would call mixed length brackets that get even more complicated. Okay, so on the one hand, this higher structure, like for example, in the four cell complex situation, on the one hand, this four cell complex, this, this higher structure does a very nice job of understanding how four cell complexes exist, but also things kind of get spiral out of control fairly rapidly when you try to study the general situation. And this is more or less equivalent to the fact that the stable homotopy groups are complicated and the stable homotopy category is complicated and we wouldn't expect there to be necessarily a simple classification of arbitrary finite cell complexes. Okay, so here's the conclusion that I'd like to draw from, from these examples and from this sort of discussion. First of all, the, the mo or most, yeah, the important thing, that pi star is not just a graded abelian group. It is a graded abelian group, okay, but it's much more than that, okay? It's also a graded commutative ring because you can compose endomorphisms, okay? But it's much more than a graded commutative ring as well. Okay, the higher structure is an, is an indispensable, indispensable part of the structure of pi star. Okay? You haven't really understood pi star unless you've understood all of this higher structure. Okay? And that's something that people who you know, spent time making explicit computations of stable homotopy groups spend a lot of time worrying about this higher structure, digging into it because it reveals so much of what's, of what's going on. Okay, and we'll talk about that higher structure at various points um, along the way. Okay, so everything I've said so far was sort of background motivation about uh, uh, classical homoto stable homotopy theory. Okay, and let me point out that uh, that much of this same story applies just as well in motivic or equivariant uh, or other contexts. Okay, the motivic stable homotopy groups, homotopy groups, or the equivariant stable homotopy groups will control finite cell complex constructions in those contexts as well. Okay, however, there is an important um, there's an important caveat here, especially in the motivic context, right? Which is that not every motivic object is built out of cells. Okay, is cellular in the sense of built out of spheres. And so you, so these stable homotopy groups are good for the cellular objects, but they're not necessarily so good for other types of ob objects, okay? The good news is that many of the most important motivic objects like the algebraic K theory spectra, or the eilenberg maclean spectra, or the, um, the, the Cobordison spectra and so forth are cellular, okay? So it's still, so just, so studying the cellular objects is motivically is still a worthwhile thing. All right, so let's talk a little bit about sort of like the background, about the contexts in which we're going to be working, okay? So in the upper left corner, I've got a little diagram here, right, of four categories and four functors, okay? In the upper left corner, cat cat corner I have the R motivic stable homotopy category, okay? And then in the lower left corner, I have the C motivic stable homotopy category. And those two categories, of course, are connected by the extension of scalars functor, right? Okay, and then in the upper right corner, I have the C2 equivariant stable homotopy category. And in this situation here, C2 is really the Galois group of C over R. That's sort of why it's C2 as opposed to some other group, okay? And Betty realization um, maps a goes from R motivic homotopy to C2 equivariant homotopy. Okay? Every R motivic spectrum has sort of, sort, of, sort of an underlying C2 equivariant spectrum, and that C2 action is the Galois action, right? Okay, and then finally, in the lower right corner, I have the classical stable homotopy theory, okay? And stable homotopy category. And then that receives functors, the forgetful functor from C2 equivariant, just forget the C2 actions, okay? And then, of course, the Betty realization from C motivic homotopy theory. Okay, so these four categories fit together very nicely. And these, 
we should think of these functors as being sort of very well behaved computationally. We can really kind of understand them um, if we set our minds to it. Okay, so the program that I, you know, I'm proposing or I'm working on is that we should be working, we should be computing in all four of these contexts simultaneously. Okay, because the the, because the way they relate along these functors tells us a lot of information that the situation becomes much more rigid and much more easy to understand if we actually do all of these at once. Okay, um, we're also going to consider k-motivic stable homotopic groups for some sort of general class of fields k, all right, but maybe in less detail than the r-motivic and the c-motivic cases. Okay, so let me defend that, that choice here. Um, that uh, uh, let me defend that choice for a minute of why focusing on the R motivic and C motivic cases rather than the uh, than the general field. Okay, so uh, the uh, so uh, the the point for me is that the R motivic and the C motivic cases are the ones that are most closely related to classical homotopy theory, to classical topology. Okay, so if you want to learn something about classical topology, or if you want to borrow tools from classical topology, then the R motivic and the C motivic cases are the places where you're most likely to, to, be, to be effective. Okay, so there's that. Okay, but also maybe even more importantly, the R motivic and the C motivic cases are more accessible, and so they're more they're good they're important tests for general theory. Okay, and a great historical example of that is what um, is what happened over the last few years with eta periodic homotopy. Okay, so eta motivically the element the Hoff map eta is not nilpotent, and we'll talk more about that in computational detail later. Okay, but it's not nilpotent, which means you could invert it and still have something non-zero. Okay, so you invert, uh, you invert your eta, okay, and you see what you get. You compute what you get. Okay, and there was a series of of, of projects um, uh, with Burke, you and myself, Andrews and Miller, uh, Glenn Wilson, Kyle Ormsby, Oliver Rundigs, Tom Bachman, Mike Hopkins, in where we started at the beginning of this series, we started looking at the C motivic computations and we figured out what happened there and then we went to the R motivic computations and we figured out what happened there and that led to um, ideas about what the general picture should look like over the rationals and then in over general fields okay so there sort of was this progression from specific cases that gave us hints about the general theory to the ge to to the general case okay and that's exactly the way it played out um, and so that's just that, that that's that's sort of an important principle here and why we want to work through I'm all I'm saying here is like we should do the easy cases first right that's that that somehow summarizes this whole this whole point okay so um, let me make some comments about sort of standing assumptions and uh, in, in general sort of philosophy for, uh, for the series. Okay, so first of all, I'm always working stably. I may not always say stable homotopy or stable homotopy group or stable homotopy category, but I always mean stably. Everything we're going to do here is stably, okay? Lots of stuff are... Um, going on, go, lots of stuff going on here, unstably in motivic homotopy theory, but that's not the subject of these talks. Okay, question, are there other motivic fracture squares um, analogous to the real and complex version? So I think what, okay, so I think what's being asked there is that back to this, back to this upper left square, are there analogous squares like this for other fields? And the answer, I, 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 if I understand the question correctly, I would say the answer really is no, right? There's something very special about the real numbers and the complex numbers and the way they relate to ordinary topology. One could try to do things with the atoll homotopy types and so forth over general fields, um, and that would probably, you know, and then general Galois groups, and that would probably be a fairly interesting thing to do. But of course, there's all that complicated technology, pro technology that has to go into that sort of thing, and I don't know how, like, say, computational that would necessarily be okay but but that's pro but working out you know th th those ideas is probably or, and a lot of those ideas have been worked out right it's probably you know it, it's probably a worthwhile thing okay and the other question is for the c2 equivariance is this naive equivariant no i mean the so-called genuine equivariant uh theory i'm thinking about um representation spheres and stabilizing with respect to all representation uh spheres Okay. 
All right. Okay, so we're always working stably. Usually, we'll have completed it at a prime, okay? And usually, that prime will be two, okay? There are some places, some parts where things work integrally, but if you're gonna do computations, as a general rule, you have to work one prime at a time. That's just the, the price you pay for actually getting compu explicit computations out, out, out of things, okay? Um, and you know, and and there are ways of reassembling all this, you know, this primary data into you know integral stuff with the, you know with all the usual sort of like technology. Okay. Um, the other standing is another standing assumption that I'm going to make is that I'm studying the stable homotopy groups here. There's another perspective on what sort of like these the fundamental invariance of the of the motivic homotopy category is, and that uses the idea of studying homotopy sheaves. Okay. Uh, and the and the the homotopy sheaves are more powerful in that they can then help you study objects that are not cellular, and so you can do much more interesting geometry and arithmetic with them. The, the downside, of course, is you, you lose a certain amount of explicit computational ability when you're working with these abstract sheaves. Okay, um, and the relate the connection between them is that the homotopy groups that I'm studying are the global sections of the homotopy sheaves. Okay, so that's what we're going to be talking about. Okay. Um, and I sort of, as I already alluded to before, we will complete as necessary to make whatever spectral sequence we're studying, we'll complete as necessary to make that thing converge. That might mean completing at a prime P, that might mean completing at that hop, also completing at the Hoff map eta. You might have to do something where you take the effective completion of, uh, of a spectrum and so on and so forth. Okay, so I am not gonna make a big deal about this, out of this completion stuff, okay? Uh, uh, generally uh, speaking, it, it, um, it, it, there is some work to be done about these convergence issues and about the behavior of these completions. And, and typically this work is manageable, okay? Uh, it's, it's not trivial, but it's manageable, right? And so we can get these spectral sequences to converge in, in, in reasonably nice ways, okay? My job is not to worry about the convergence. My job is to sort of figure out what the computations are, right? And so that's what we'll talk about. Okay, question. Um, is it then known that uh, about a homotopy, what about a homotopy sheaf version of the motivic atoms spectral sequence? So that is a good question. Off the top of my head, I have never thought that through. Maybe some other people here have some idea that my instinct tells me that it would, that it, it should work just fine. Uh, the problem is that in abstractly, you should be able to set up such a, a thing just fine. That my, uh, however, um, it's not at all clear that you're going to be able to make this sort of fundamental computations to get things off of the off of the ground. Okay, um, and then sort of related question there: um, what what you lose specifically when you work with the homotopy sheaves is that you that that, that maybe the spectral sequences exist, but there's there's sort of there, there's another thing that you need besides the existence of the spectral sequence. The other thing you need is some input computations that you have to start with, right? And so, what, for example, when you're thinking about the atom spectral sequence, and we'll get to this in a little bit, but so this is a little bit of a preview, but when you think about the atom spectral sequence, you can set it up abstractly, but that's only useful if you know what the Kolm algebra point is and you already know what the Steenrod algebra is. If you have no idea what the Steenrod algebra is, right? Then, then the atom spectral sequence is nothing more than an abstract toy, okay? So that's the problem with the, with, with the, the, the sheaves, right? If you're going to sort of work with the sheaves, you're probably going to, I don't, I, I, I don't know, I don't want to speculate right here live about what you're going to need, but, but I have a feeling that those sort of those input computations are, are, are just kind of like, you know, not really things you can write down. Or... Okay, all right. Um, so uh, we'll complete as necessary. And then finally, one last comment here about um, of just about notation is that the grading convention that I will adopt is, you know, in this form P comma Q, this is the, this is the grading convention that Vavodsky used. Uh, P is like the topological degree. Q is the motivic weight. And then P minus Q is, some, is frequently a quantity that one wants to study. And, uh, and I'll call that the co-weight. Okay, because it's sort of a partner to uh, sort of a partner, sort of dual in a sense to weight. Okay, and this does not agree uh, with the notation that all um, authors have used on the, in this subject, but it's the one that I'll stick with. Okay, consistently. All right. 
So even before we get, we're, we are certainly headed for the atom spectral sequence. That is the sort of like the first big tool that we're going to use. But even before we get to the atom spectral sequence, let's do, let's go back to sort of like prehistory, even before that, before the atom spectral sequence was used to study stable homotopic groups, there were some more geometric constructions, okay, that, that work in sort of very low degrees, okay? So let's talk about that style of, um, uh, uh, of constructing stable homotopy elements, okay? So, and some of these ideas are due to, many of these ideas are due to Morel. Some are uh, written down by Duggar and myself, um, and then who and Creech as well have contributed at, contributed at various points along this way, okay? So these geometric constructions, the good thing about these, these constructions is that they are universal, okay? They work over spec Z, and therefore automatically are going to work in, in sort of over any base, okay? In, in the motivic context, over any base. Okay, all right, so the first element that I want to discuss is the element rho, okay, in pi minus one minus one. Okay, so this element rho can be constructed. You take plus or minus one and you conclude it, conclude it, include it into GM, okay, and just as a matter of notation, GM here, I just mean A1 minus zero. I take the affine line, I puncture it, and then that's GM. That's, that's you know, for the multiplicative group, whatever, but we won't really need that. G, well, anyway, it's GM. It's just a, it's a more convenient notation. If you include plus or minus one into GM, you get something that turns, in some cases, turns out to be non-trivial. Okay, and we'll call that rho. Okay, more generally, you can include one and some unit u into GM, okay, and get an element of of pi minus one minus one that we could maybe call bracket u. Okay, and rho is another name for bracket minus one. Okay, rho comes up so frequently that we give it its, its, its own name and these bracket u's in general are a little more obscure. Okay, so these are already some geometric constructions, okay, closely related to the arithmetic of the field, right? Okay, um, oh, and why is it minus one minus one, right? Because this is an S zero, zero, and this is an S one, one, and then the relative degree is minus one minus one, okay? Um, then there's an element epsilon in pi zero zero. So that's the twist map. You have GM smash GM. You have a symmetry, right? Swap the factors to GM smash GM. The relative degree there is zero comma zero. That's in pi zero zero. Okay. And because it's a twist map, not surprisingly, this epsilon controls commutativity. And we'll write down a formula in a minute for what exactly I mean by that. But epsilon is, is essential if you're going to want to study some form of commutativity. Okay. So now... So the, uh, those are sort of like the elementary, like most naive, you know, some of the most naive things you could think of, okay? And now things get a little more interesting, okay? And so you borrow an idea from very classical topology, right? From, um, from at least as far back as Hopf, right? Okay, so, um, and you can construct a Hopf map eta, okay? In pi one comma one. I'm, I'm going to construct eta in a way that's it's probably not the most common. It's probably not the way that most people who have seen this before think of, of, of eta, okay? But it's, it, it's, it's useful for a certain perspective, okay? So eta is in pi 1, 1. So here's what I do, okay? Start with gm cross gm, okay? And it has a multiplication map to gm, right? GM is a group, right? And then suspend it once. That's what the suspensions are, okay? So this mu is really suspension of mu, okay? So there's that map mu, okay? It turns out for very general reasons, okay, after one suspension, a product always splits. Okay? This is a very general fact about, about homotopy uh, theory, and, and so, this, so this, this product splits, and, and one of the summands of this splitting is the suspension of GM smash GM, okay? So there's this inclusion here, right, that comes from this very general categorical splitting. Okay, so now you have a map from suspension GM smash GM into suspension GM, okay, that composition. And you go and you count the degrees. What do you have here? You have um, one, two, three spheres, two twists, right? So three comma two. Here you have two spheres and one twist, and so you have two comma one, okay? And then the relative degree is, is one comma one, okay? So there is, uh, there is a map eta. Okay, and that map, that's the same, the way that people usually think about eta as the projection from A2 minus zero down to P1, okay? And this is the same map, or maybe it's off by a minus sign, but it's essentially the same map as, um, as that construction, okay? Uh, and, oh, the other thing, you know, I should have said this at the beginning, actually, you know, all of these geometric constructions that I'm doing here are, um, are, are unstable, 
right? I'm actually doing unstable constructions here and then stabilizing them, right, in order to get stable homotilities. But this map, eta, really exists in S32 to S21 unstably, okay? And so, so there's eta, okay? And then you know from classical topology that the Hopf maps don't end at eta, that there are higher dimensional analogs of these things. And so we'll take a look at the next one, okay, nu. All right, so here's what you can do with nu. You can take the group SL2, okay? Uh, that's, of course, a group. And then, and you have the multiplication map, right, after one suspension from S suspension SL2 cross SL2 to suspension SL2, okay? And you mu, all right? And again, this categorical splitting, right, gives you a map from suspension SL2 smash SL2 into suspension SL2. Okay, now here's the interesting fact. It turns out that SL2 has the homotopy type of S3 comma two, okay? That's not a hard, that's a relatively easy geometric thing you can do. You just look at columns that have to be, you know, uh, and determine it has to be one and you can kind of contract, you know, things down and get that equivalence. That's not a, that's not a, a very hard fact, but it's an observation, okay? And so then SL2 is an S32, SL2 is an S32, SL2 is an S32, and you go up and you count degrees and you end up with a map from S74 to S42, okay? And then that gives you a construction new that works unstably and it works over any uh, over any possible base. Okay, finally something weird happened here. Hang on a second. This is supposed to be S74. Okay. Now with sigma, a new complication arises. A new co the new complication is that you can't model sigma as this kind of hop construction on a group object. Okay, what you have to use is a non-associative multiplication. Okay, but you can show that over any base S7 comma four has a non-associative multiplication, okay? And then you use that non-associative multiplication in the same way as before, using the, the, that splitting to get a map from S15 comma eight to S8 comma four, and that's pi seven four, okay? Uh, so great, so that's the classical stuff, right? And now we know from classical history that you can't really expect to go much further at this sort of naive level. Right, that um, that there's something maybe more sophisticated. If you really want to go further, you have something you have more sophisticated that you have to do. Okay, but before we dive into those more sophisticated techniques, let's talk a little bit. So we've got these elements: rho, bracket u, epsilon, eta, nu, sigma, and let's talk a little bit about relations amongst these things. Okay, so who and Kreish proved a very nice result. Um, it's basically a Steinberg relation that u bracket u times bracket one minus u always equals zero, okay? And epsilon squared is one, that epsilon was the twist, and so if you twist twice, of course you get the identity, okay? And here's the formula, I wrote it down here for the formula for graded commutativity. If you wanna compare alpha beta and beta alpha, what you have to do is possibly put in a minus sign, right? And possibly put in an epsilon factor. Okay, depending on the degree of alpha and beta. Okay, the exact formula here is not so important right now. You can look that up later if it's a formula that you want to use. But the point is if you do the kind of like the diagram chasing and you figure out exactly what happens when you swap factors around, you have a plus or minus one and maybe an epsilon um, in there as well in order to switch things. Okay, and that's sort of a really interesting wrinkle. Uh, classically, we see the minus one, we don't see the epsilon. And that's a really interesting uh, wrinkle, okay? Um, you can show that rho times one minus epsilon is zero. You can do this geometrically. You can draw, you can construct complexes and show that this factors through something contractible, right? Same thing with eta times one minus epsilon, um, eta times nu, and nu times sigma. You can, can, you can show all of, the, all of these relations here, you can show them geometrically by constructing, you know, uh, uh, complexes that, constructing, constructing objects that are, that are contractible that these compositions factor through. Okay, and of course, um, for those who know about this stuff, what you're seeing on this slide is a lot of information about Milner-Witt K-theory, right? Uh, some of what's going on in Milner-Witt K-theory is appearing in some of these formulas. Milner-Witt Milner K-theory is saying even more than that, and I don't wanna get into that um, uh, uh, in, in, in these talks, but I just wanna sort of make a nod to that whole circle of ideas that you can, um, that, 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 that you can develop them, them further. Okay, so instead, I'd like to go in a different direction, okay? So um, how might you go deeper? How might you produce more stable homotopy elements? 
okay? Well, one thing you could do is you could follow Toda's classical work. So Toda um, uh, carried out some sort of amazing stable homotopy group computations with like with really very little technology like without using things like the atom spectral sequence he was able to go remarkably far into the structure of the classical stable homotopy groups and you could try to follow the approach that he the, the kind of approaches that he adopted for example you could use tota brackets okay so a tota bracket is a way of building new stable homotopy elements out of old ones it's kind of like composition but more sophisticated Okay, and we've talked a little bit about that earlier. This is part of the higher structure of the stable homotopy groups. Okay, so one, the, the first example that, um, that, that, that occurs is this total bracket that I've written down on the screen. So eta comma one minus epsilon comma nu squared. Okay, it turns out that we know geometrically, we know that eta times one minus epsilon is zero. You could, I already wrote that relation down. And then it also turns out that one minus epsilon times nu squared is also known to be zero. Okay, and that those two relations make this total bracket defined in pi 8, 5. Okay, and that thing exists. That's again, this is all over spec Z, right? This is in the universal or even unstably, right? You can even make this unstable total bracket. This all works in complete generality. Okay, and you could try to go further, right? But it gets harder and harder and more and more ad hoc, and it's just not sort of, you know, um, well, you could do it. I just, you know, and, and but this is as far as people have, I think, really gone in this direction. And again, I again, I do think that people could go further if they um, decided to sit down and and think it through. Okay, so um, this is kind of the end. Uh, okay, all right. So now we come to kind of like to a turning point in the history of stable homotopy groups, right? With the advent of the Adams spectral sequence. Okay, so the atom spectral sequence is, of course, due to atoms, right? But it was also, um, one should give a certain amount of credit to Serre as well, right? So Serre uh, had, this, had this, some ideas about computing, state, computing homotopy groups by this method of, you know, of using cohomology of eilenberg mclean spaces. And to a, a large extent, what Adams is doing is systematizing and organizing the kind of ad hoc approach that, um, that, um, uh, that that Sayre was sort of trying to kind of like to, trying to describe. Okay, question: Do we have motivic Mohawald root invariants defined? So yes, there are um, root invariants running around in this story. Um, there are a few different ways that you the a few different things you could mean by that. Okay, and the uh, the. Uh, the short answer is that you should look at uh, J.D. Quigley's work. J.D. Quigley has written a couple of papers, I think, about motivic homotopy theory and root invariance, and he has shown how to construct these things in some level of generality that I forget off the top of my head, and he uh, has carried out some computations, right, and kind of indicating what maybe these things are good for. Okay, uh, and there's another sort of, let me just, since we're on the subject of root invariance, let me also say that um, one of the sort of ongoing projects that, that I and some of my co-authors have is to use our motivic homotopy theory to further our knowledge of classical root invariance. Like I think that our motivic, the homotopy theory can beat the, um, can beat the classical topologists at their own game, that we can do better at, at computing um, root invariance if we use a little bit of motivic homotopy theory, okay? All right, um, and it looks like in the chat that there was a link posted to, uh, to J.D. Quigley if you wanna know more about a motivic root invariance. That's a, that's a good question. Okay, so. We're gonna talk about the atom spectral sequence, okay? This is um, supposed to be a summer school, right? And this is the first week of this summer school. And so I decided that um, to spend a, uh, a certain amount of time kind of covering, um, covering you know, what's, really, what's really background, right? And so I wanna talk um, in some detail about how, about what the atom spectral sequence is, about how you construct it, and why this particular construction ought to be something useful and interesting. Okay, so this this next part of the of the talk is really all classical review. Okay, and then I'll say some things about the motivic and equivariant um, variations, you know, that that come up maybe at the end. Okay, so I'm going to write H for HFP, right? Lindbergh-McLean spectrum. 
and a prime. Okay, and I write p, but really in my own head, I think p equals two because I'm always working at, at, at two, but, but I guess we don't need to do that here, okay? And h star, right, the coefficients of h star is, um, is fp, right? That's easy enough, okay? And then the other thing we need is h star h, or in other words, the homotopy of h smash h, okay? And that's the dual steamer in algebra, a star, okay, which is a Hopf algebra. Okay, so it has a multiplication and a co-multiplication. Okay, so this uh, Hopf, this this a star, it's kind of complicated. I'm not writing down the formulas for it right now, although we will write down formulas later. Okay, but the point is that it is completely explicit. It's completely known. Okay, the other thing that I'm doing is that I am always writing the dual steamer algebra. I am never talking in this entire series. I am never going to talk about the steamer algebra. I'm only going to talk about the dual steamer algebra because um, it turns out that it, that the computations work out much more nicely in the dual case. Of course, in some philosophical sense, they're equivalent. All you're doing is doing is dualizing over a field, but uh, the the formulas are much nicer to write down uh, in in the dual situation. And so that's one of the one of the real one of the early obstacles that a lot of students have to diving into this subject is making that transition from the steam run algebra, which is more natural psychologically to the dual steel steam rate algebra, which is much easier to work with in practice, okay? So um, that's something that you kind of have to train yourself to spend some time doing and you have to train yourself to think in those dual terms. Okay, so there is a unit map from the, uh, from the sphere to H, okay? And it has, um, and then that gives you, a, if you take the fiber, you get a cofiber sequence and that's the definition of H bar, okay? So H bar is like the difference between the sphere and H, okay? And that looks like sort of just sort of an arbitrary thing. You know, there's no motivation for that, okay? But here's a little bit of motivation, right? If you look at the homotopy groups of H smash H bar, right? What you end up doing is you end up taking A, you get A bar, right? Which is the augmentation ideal of the dual steamer algebra. So H, um, H smash H bar has a nice algebraic interpretation, right? It's a topological thing, right? But algebraically, it's corresponding to taking the augmentation ideal. Okay, all right, so here's, so that's the ingredients that we need, okay? So here's how you construct an Adams resolution, okay? So you start with, here's this cofiber sequence that we just talked about on the left, those two maps make a cofiber sequence, okay? And then if you take that cofiber sequence and you smash it with H bar, right? Take each of these three objects and smash them with H bar, you get these three objects, okay? And so those three objects also form a cofiber sequence, okay? And then if you take those three objects and you smash them again with H bar, you get those three objects and you get another cofiber sequence, okay? So in this picture, each of these L-shaped, these, these three terms in a shape of an L form a cofiber sequence, okay? The, the, the row itself is not any kind of exact thing. It's, um, it's, um, it, it, it's more of like of a resolution or something like that. Okay, all right, so whenever you have this kind of sequence of nested cofiber sequences, right, you end up with a spectral sequence, okay? The spectral sequence starts with the homotopy of these third terms, this H, this H mesh, H bar, H mesh, H bar, H mesh, H bar, and so on and so forth, starts with the homotopy of these third terms, and it converges to the homotopy of S0. Okay, another way of thinking about this is that here's S0 and you filter S0 along this tower. This is like a filtration of S0. And then these are the associated gradient. These are the layers of the filtration, like the associated gradient. That's another good way of thinking about it, okay? And that's what a spectral sequence does, right? It goes from the layer, you, you, you passes from the layers to the whole object, right? And so that's exactly what you get here. So the E1 page, a of this spectral sequence has the homotopy of all these guys, right? And it converges to the homotopy of the sphere, okay? And then to make this converge, you need some comp P completions here, right, for convergence. And that's okay. You've chosen a P up at the very beginning here, right? And so, um, so there's some convergence there, but that's that, uh, which again, you know, as I've said, is manageable, right? There's some things to do, but it's manageable. Okay, so this looks fine, right? But what's really going on here? Why would you do this? Why, what, what makes this sort of any, anything useful other than just some like arbitrary, like, you know, crazy arrows that I've written down on the screen? Well, it turns out 
that this E1 page is totally computable, right? We know a lot about H smash H bar. H smash H bar, I wrote that down earlier. That's the augmentation ideal, okay? And it turns out when you smash with more powers of H bar, it, it still is computable, okay? And so what you get in this E1 page, this E1 page, I've written it out here more explicitly, okay? You get an F2, that's from H, that's the homotopy of H. You get an A bar, that's the homotopy of H smash H bar. And then you get the second tensor power of A bar. That's what this homotopy turns out to be. That's not very hard, it's a little bit of a computation. And you can get that that's the second tensor power of A bar. And then the third tensor power and the fourth tensor power and so on and so forth. Okay, so this E1 page, this has a name. This is, the, this is called the Cobar complex of A. Okay, and we'll talk a little, we'll talk in more detail about this thing later and carry out some computations. Okay, what this thing is, is a differential graded algebra whose homology is, is the X groups of the ring A over with coefficients in F2 comma F2. Okay, so this Cobar complex is sort of like is it, it's kind of it's a fundamental object, right? It's um, it's 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 a key tool for computing X. Okay, and this observation I think is really now that I've written this down, I think now you can go back and you can look at the motivation for what the Adams resolution is doing. Okay, when you want to study the higher invariance of a ring, F two because you're taking the prime two. Yeah, exactly. That's a typo. That could be. These can be, those, those twos should be P's at this level. I just, I always forget because I literally, like I eat and breathe and sleep P equals two. And so I just, I constantly forget that. Okay. Um, so, uh, so when you want to study the higher invariance of a ring, we know what to do. We take a resolution and we take derived, you know, X and all that and Tor and all that sort of stuff, right? We take, we, we, we do that sort of thing. And the Cobar complex is a nice convenient tool for those resolutions and doing those kinds of derived constructions. Okay. So what's happening here in this Adams resolution is you're doing, you're, you're trying, you're playing out that same story right, of looking, um, of taking resolutions and looking for higher invariance, but instead of doing it in algebra, you're doing it in topology. You're using the spectra themselves to build the resolution, right, but you're really mimicking the algebraic situation here in topology, okay? So that's a good kind of one, a good way of sort of motivating, of wrapping your head around what the atom spectral sequence is really trying to do. Okay. So Ben, sorry to have interrupted you. Yep. There is a question on the chat. Uh, one more P on the E1 page. Um, I don't see it right here. Here. Oh, yes, you're right. Okay, thank you. Yeah, that should be a P as well. Great. Okay. All right. So um, the upshot here is that the E2 page turns out to be, um, is X over, over A, FP comma FP, okay? And then that's converging to the stable homotopy groups, okay? That's the kind of like, that, that's kind of like, you know, the, the, the consequence of having done all this, okay? And, and that's kind of like the key, that, that's, I mean, somehow, some sense, like, that's the thing that you need to remember from all this. If, like, you didn't wrap your head fully around what all of this, um, um, uh, if you didn't fully wrap your head around this whole construction of the atom spectral sequence and where it comes from and wh what it's motivated by, you don't necessarily need to worry too much about that. What's important is that there is a spectral sequence. It starts from X groups and it converges to the stable homotopy groups. Okay, and we're not really going to dive into any of the details of the construction in the rest of these uh, of these talks, but we are frequently going to be talking about X groups and how they're related to stable homotopy groups. Okay, so this one, this 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 formula right here at the bottom is really kind of like the thing that we need to carry forward with us. Okay, so here is the program. The program is first compute those X groups. Okay, that's an algebraic exercise. We know A explicitly, we know FP, we, we can do that X groups explicitly, that's, that's algebraic. Then it's a spectral sequence and this spectral sequence can have differentials and it does have differentials, okay? So you have to analyze the differentials in the atom spectral sequence, okay? And then finally, you get this E infinity page, but then there's some interpretation of the final answer. And that is involved the solving extension problems. 
okay? We're gonna talk in great detail about each of these three parts of the program. But this is, this is how it goes. There's always these three steps. You need the algebraic input, you need to analyze the differentials, and then you need to interpret, you need to analyze the hidden extensions interpreting the final answer. Okay, so everything I've said over the last few minutes was entirely in the classical context, okay? But these all work just fine k-motivically. This is a pretty general setup here, right? And it works just fine k-motivically or g-equivariantly. Um, and uh, the key point is you need to know about the cohomology of a point or the homology of a point, I guess, and you need to know the dual steering algebra explicitly. If you know the dual steering algebra explicitly and you know the homology of a point explicitly, then you're ready to go. You can start an atom spectral sequence project, okay? Uh, and and uh, there are um, there are comp there are additional complications with convergence in this motivic or equivariant context, but these are the the uh, they are manageable. They requ requires it requires real work, but these these things work out. Okay, and so various people who have worked on these construction these sort of foundational stuff for the motivic or equivariant atom spectral sequence include Morel, Duggar, myself, who increase, who increase in Ormsby, um, maybe maybe some others as well. Okay, question: Is this X in modules or co-modules? Is there a difference? Okay, um, so what I um, this is a good question, and this is an important point, and I always get sort of tripped up about this, and then there's Tor and Kotor also and all the duality, okay? So what I'm thinking of here is X in modules, okay? Notice when I wrote X sub A here, I didn't write A star, I wrote A, okay? And so that's what I mean. I mean, A is a ring, FP is a module over A, and I'm taking the derived functors of Han, HOM in the category of A modules. Okay, that's what I'm referring to here. Okay, it, um, you know, when you take X, right, what you do is you take a resolution for F2, right, for FP in the first variable, right, and then you hom it into FP, right, and then you take homology. Okay, and the Cobar complex is what, what you get. The Cobar complex is the thing that you, when you take a free resolution of FP and then you hom it into FP, what you get is the Cobar complex, okay? And then the homology of the Cobar complex is X over A, okay? So that, so, so that sort of duality is kind of built in when I take the Cobar complex, it's that HOM into FP that's happening there, okay? So that's the right way to, to think about this. You can set this all up in the category of, of co-modules, okay? The co category of co-modules is like dual, is equivalent to the category of modules in some sense, and you can set it all up that way and change the names of things. Um, but, but let me just leave it there, that's saying, I mean X of, of, of A modules, X in A modules. Okay. Uh, all right, so what we need to learn about, right, is the cohomology of the classical steamer algebra. In other words, that's the name that we give to X of A, um, F2, F2. So now I'm writing P equals two here because I want to talk in detail about how the computations play out, okay? So that's the first thing we need to do. We need to dive in to this algebra and, and, and study, with, study this, okay? So in the 21st century, the way that we study these X groups is by machine, okay? Um, computers love to do linear algebra and we can ask the computer to construct minimal free A resolutions of F2 as long as, and it will, um, it will hum along for a few months and produce all kinds of great data. Some people who um, are closely associated with this idea are uh, Bruner, Nassau, and uh, Guo Zhen Wang, who at various points have, um, have imp written and implemented um, effective software for doing this. Okay, these computations are effectively implemented in a very large range, okay, out to like, you know, at, uh, at you know, say maybe 200 or more stems, okay, far beyond our ability to interpret it, okay, and that will always be the case, right, we'll, we'll, um, so we should take the computer data essentially as, as given, right, we have as much computer data as we want, okay, so I am going to switch now. Let's, so let's take a look at what this ends up being, okay? And we'll talk more about where this comes from um, uh, in, in later points. But for now, I just want to dive in. I want to sort of look. Let's just look at some data, okay? 
So what you're looking at here is a classical X chart, okay, or an at or you know a classical Adams chart, okay. Um, what you you do see off to the right, you see some blue and red lines. Those are Adams differentials, which I don't want to talk about now. We'll come back later and we'll look at this chart again. It's just I this was the chart I had available, and so I just. I used it, right? But we want to kind of ignore those, those blue and red lines and just, just look at the black dots and lines, okay? So this is what you get, right? There's this huge bi-graded group, okay? And it starts off looking in low dimensions. It starts off looking not too bad, okay? Um, it's, you know, it seems sort of manageable, right? And even in this range, right, there aren't too many dots. It sort of seems manageable, right? And as you go out further, things get more complicated, but still not too bad. It's a, getting me a little, a little bit crazy around here. Um, and then things get worse, you know, and you sort of, you know, more, maybe more and more regular. If I zoom out a little bit, I can show it. This chart goes out to 70. We have charts that go much further than that, but that, that obviously, um, but going out to 70 kind of like proves the point. When you get out into this range, things get, and again, we kind of want to ignore the colored lines, but even just look at the number of dots. Like right here in this degree, there are three different dots, right? So things get a little bit complicated. Okay. You can see some regular patterns, right? Like if you look up along the top, you see this a regular repeating pattern there. Okay. And you also kind of see some parallelograms that kind of regularly repeat along here. And there's some, there is some regularity at the top of the chart. And there's a lot of noise along, along the bottom. Okay. So this is what happens. You start with the steamer algebra, you start with F2, you compute X, and you get this thing, right, that has structure, that has um, you know, periodicity that has some regular structure, but also has a lot of, of irregular structure, okay? And that's what you expect. As you go into higher and higher stems, you expect to see more and more complications, more and more irregularities end up occurring, okay? All right, so that's not meant to be, so there's no detail here, right, of course, and, and that's not the point. This is sort of more like of a cultural kind of presentation rather than anything, um, you know, in, uh, in, in specific, but to give a sense of what's going on. Um, I should mention, well, while we're looking at this and the things we've talked about before, um, this guy here, H naught, that's the th that guy detects the element two, okay? And that's four and that's eight and so forth. H1 detects eta in pi one. H2 detects nu in pi three. And there's sigma in pi seven. Okay, we talked about eta, nu, and sigma, the motivic versions of them, but these are the classical versions, eta, nu, and sigma in pi, pi one, pi three, pi sigma, pi seven. Okay, and we also talked about this guy, this bracket in pi eight five, right? And we talked about this sort of like way you could construct another element in pi eight five, and that's corresponding to this element right there called C zero. Okay, that's how I knew to write down that particular total bracket because I knew that C zero, that's the next thing that you might be interested in. Right, and so you can so and so I wrote down a bracket for that next thing, and then pH one you could try to write down a bracket for pH one and pH two and d zero and so forth, right? And these would be perfectly worthwhile things to have have constructions of. Okay, so you are already kind of picking up a lot of of information just by looking at this chart kind of qualitatively without even worrying so much about where things um, exactly come from. Okay, so now the other thing I want to do, and again this is ah. Okay, sorry, um, the question about the degrees here. Right, so the, the vertical axis here is the Adams filtration, okay? Um, and the horizontal axis, axis is the stem, the vertical axis is the Adams filtration, and that's how all of my charts will be organized, okay? So this is a classical chart, so there is no weight, okay? It's just C0 in pi eight here, okay? Um, turns out it's, it's, its weight is eight five, okay? Um, when I do show you motivic atoms charts later, they will not, they'll, the weight will be suppressed, right? That, that the, the, the motivic atom spectral sequence is trigraded. There's the topological degree, there's the weight, and there's the atom filtration. Well, I, I, I can't plot it in three dimensions. I've tried and it's, it doesn't work. So I have to suppress the weight, okay? And so you would, so pi eight five will appear right here and you won't see the five. You'll have to kind of, you have to do, go into the computations or look up the tables and see what the weights of these, these, these elements are. All the weights are known and they're in tables, but they're not displayed on the charts. Okay, that's a great question about, about, about the, how the charts are laid out and where the weights are. Okay, so now what I want to do is I want to show you a different thing. I want to show you this. Okay, so I want to, this, this, maybe I'm just sort of showing off here by, uh, okay, you guys should be able to see a window. Okay, so this is a Chrome browser, 
and it is displaying an app that uh, Hood Chatham uh, wrote, so or is writing. So this thing is a um, this the, he, Hood is writing a spectral sequence sort of analysis tool. Okay, it doesn't do the hardcore computations. The hardcore computations are done elsewhere and then imported into this interactive tool. Okay, so I can scroll around on this thing, right? And I can click on a by degree, right? And then I click on that by degree, and over here it lists on the right side. It shows me the name, gives me the names of the classes, and it tells me something about the products. Okay, um, I can move. Um, I can move elements around if I want to. For example, if I don't like the way these things are located, I can go in here and I can I can s switch their locations like it just did. Okay. Um, and, 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 and so forth. Okay. So this is still in relatively primitive um, state. It's not ready for public release, but it is making progress. And I thought I would like to show it off and put in a plug for the, um, for the great work that, that Hood is doing. This kind of a tool is going, is, is a great way of sort of keeping track of what's going on. You know, when you get into higher stems, right, and there end up being so many elements, right, after a while, that you really need a good way of keeping track of things, right, and all these different relations, right, and this is this nice interactive tool for really studying things. We intend eventually to allow um, input atoms, differentials, and so forth, and make it a really nice scratch pad for carrying out spectral sequence computation. So that's something that I'm hoping coming in the next year or so, a product that, you know, that, um, that, that that I certainly want to use and that maybe other people who are carrying out these kinds of explicit computations would be interested in as well. Okay, so let me go back now to the presentation. Okay. And I want this one. Okay. Um, so what I want to do next is talk about how you, you know, studying these X computations in more detail, what's really going on in these X computations. Okay. And a good, the, sort of like the most naive way to tackle this, the, these X groups to begin with is to study the Cobar complex. Okay. So, um, I want to say a little bit of, we're almost out of time for today. So I'll say a little bit about this now and then we'll pick this up again, I think on Thursday, the next talk. Um, but I'll, we'll start talking about it now. Okay. So first of all, what I, I've been talking about the dual steroid algebra, but I haven't told you what it is explicitly. Okay. So what it is, is a polynomial algebra um, over on generators, zeta one, zeta two, zeta three, and so forth. Okay. And this is a computation. This is due to Milner. Okay, um, but this thing is a Hopfer algebra, not just an algebra. Okay, it's got a product and a coproduct. Okay, and the coproduct, I've written down a formula for the coproduct over here on the right. Okay, so this is a complicated formula with a lot of moving parts um, and not so easy to understand. And I don't expect you to sort of stare at this thing and memorize and wrap your head around it fully. Well, one thing to remember is that the coproduct in the dual corresponds to the product in the steroid algebra. So in the steroid algebra, you have these ADEM relations, right? That have to do with the product structure. The ADEM relations are somehow encoded in this coproduct information here, okay? The product, the nice polynomial product over here corresponds to the coproduct in the steroid algebra. That's the Carton formula. The Carton formula is a nice regular thing in the steroid algebra, and that's corresponding to the nice regular polynomial structure here, okay? One thing that I want to point out is that um, the, the, what are the primitive elements? The primitive elements are elements whose coproduct is just themselves tensor one plus one tensor themselves. Okay, and the elements that are primitive are precisely zeta one two to the n. Okay, um, and 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 th and that's it. Okay, if you take anything else other than zeta one um, to a power of two, uh, then you're going to get something that's not primitive. Okay, so that's kind of a, a, an important point that we'll see in a minute here. Okay, so the Cobar complex is, we've talked about this, F2, A, I guess I mean A bar, okay? And then um, 
a bar, tensor a bar, and so on and so forth, okay? And if you dive a little deeper into the cobar complex and you look at what these maps are, you discover that this first map is the coproduct, okay? So if you want to actually compute the homology of the cobar complex, which is exactly what we want, we want the homology, you need to understand this, 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 um, this co-product, which I've written down here, okay? And we'll dive into this um, next time, okay? So next time, we'll, we'll, we'll go back a little bit, we'll, we'll set up the cobar complex again, and we'll dive more into computing um, X groups, and we'll carry out lots of explicit examples. Okay, I think that's a good place to stop for today. Uh, okay, many thanks indeed, and let's thank the speaker. And so, <clears throat> are there any questions? Please raise your hand over the chat, please. Uh, there is a question. There, yeah. Are there people working with Motivic? Um, he wrote ANSS, which is Adams Novikov spectral sequence for other primes pre. And Adams Novikov spectral sequence is something to work on. But what we've been talking about today is Adams spectral sequence at, um, at other primes. So um, not so much. Okay. There are some sort of, there are kind of, there are some philosophical reasons to anticipate that, that while the motivic atom spectral sequence has been sort of really interesting at, um, at the prime two, that the at odd prime somehow things are a little bit more kind of just like the classical story with some extra weights thrown in and a little bit of curiosity. Okay. There are some indications that that has been, or let, let me say, let me re rephrase that. Let me say the conventional wisdom over the last 10 years has been that somehow the odd primary computations will be like classical with a little kind of like, you know, perturbation, a little, a little, you know, a few little wrinkles. Um, and that the P equals two computations are somehow much more, um, uh, much more fundamentally interesting. I, over time, I'm becoming less and less convinced of that conventional wisdom. So I consider sort of like this odd primary computations to be a sort of a wide open subject. I think there's a lot of room for someone to dive in and, and, and really sort of tear these things apart and see what's going on and have a good and try to get a better understanding of, of, of what's happening there. So um, there is some work, you know, um, uh, but there's really nothing like real well developed. Okay, other question. Any special cohomology theory such that sigma or nu is not zero? Okay. Um, so I question, um, I, I think the idea here is that, um, can you, so, so the thing about, you know, um, about ordinary cohomology is that it detects one, right. And sort of nothing else. Right. And, um, and maybe, and, but then something like KO complex, uh, re, re, sorry, not complex, real K theory detects the element eta. Right, and then the idea is that could you go further along those lines and find something further more complicated than KO that detects nu and detects sigma? Okay, so it depends on what you're looking for. But one thing that detects nu, um, nu is is TMF. Okay, and that's sort of one big reason why TMF is so interesting is that it captures eta and nu and the various higher consequences of having eta and nu at hand, okay? And, and yet it throws out all of the additional complications that occur with sigma and in, in higher places. Like, so for example, when we wrote down that form, that total bracket for that guy in pi eight, that, what was it, eta comma one minus epsilon comma nu squared, well, that's a thing that's built out of eta and nu and two and things like that. And so that guy does, is detected by TMF. Okay, because it's it's associated to those eta and nu type family, right? Um, and so that so that's one answer is that that's kind of like from my perspective, that's why TMF is so interesting. Other people have other reasons for it, and that's and those are important reasons also. Similar work regarding the equivariant case. Yes, absolutely. We are in the midst of cranking through the atom spectral sequence um, at for the C2 equivariant atom spectral sequence anyway, and we are making progress. Um, I'm hoping by the end of the third talk to at least talk a little bit about that. That's time permitting. We may or may not get to that, but absolutely um, one, can, um, one can see um, there's work there by um, Bert Guillou and myself, um, Mike Hill, Doug Ravenel, Bert Guillou and myself, um, and Hannah Kong has also made some progress along those lines. Um, Milner Vit K theory know about nu and sigma. Um, nu, Milner Vit K theory does not know about nu and sigma. I wrote on that slide here, I can share that. Let me find that slide. 
I wrote on this slide, I'll see also Milner Vit K theory. What I meant by that was that many of the formulas that I wrote down, many of the constructions and formulas that I wrote down in this section are related to Milner Vit Milner K theory. Not all of it, in particular, the nu and the sigma are not in Milner Vit K theory, but the eta, the rho, the one minus epsilon, the bracket u, that part of it is really sitting inside of Milner K theory. I'm, I'm sorry for that. that. That was my fault for writing a confusing slide. Okay. Um, Echovariant dual Steinway algebra for p and odd prime. So yes, um, lots is known about the equivariant um, Steinway algebra uh, at at even primes and at odd primes. The thing to remember is that you have to have a group as well. Okay, so it depends on what group. If you're working with C two, then I think we know both the odd and the you know, we, we know the, the two primary steam rate algebra. We also know the odd primary steam, primary steam rate algebra, but the odd primary steam rate, steam rate algebra is not very interesting. It's C2, C, C2 is a group of order two. We expect the P equals two computations to be more interesting than the odd primary <coughs> computations. For CP, uh, for an odd prime P for CP, I think that this is now known um, and maybe in slightly more generality. What I would look at is, um, I would go, I don't have the top of my head, I don't have the answer, but I would go search for um, things that, that Igor Kreish and various co-authors have, have written, have been writing recently, have been writing about this, and I forget exactly what, but there is sort of an ongoing program to expand these kind of steam rod algebra, Kolm algebra point computations into larger and larger classes of, of groups, okay? Um, and unfortunately, things get kind of really complicated really quickly, and it's and we're not really yet we're not ready yet to dive into atoms computations with those types of things yet because they're they're just even C two is really giving us a real are giving us a real challenge, and the bigger groups are just going to be a nightmare at this point. Although eventually we'll get there, but but it's 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 that's off in the future. Um, Adam's type spectral sequence based on Chow Witt cohomology. I have not thought about that. Um, I'm not exactly sure what you mean by child wit cohomology. I think maybe you mean something like KQ um, or KQ with eta inverted or something like that. Um, so maybe you're kind of getting at some sort of version of, you know, this at, so this BO resolutions. Um, yeah. So yeah, I think you mean KQ with eta inverted then maybe, maybe. Um, I, I don't know. Um, what that reminds me uh, 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 the question, Sean Tilson's question reminds me about, about Chow Witt cohomology, re reminds me of is this, this, this story of BO resolutions. So Mahowald and co-authors um, attempted to mimic the atom spectral sequence, but instead of using cohomology H, ordinary cohomology, they used, um, they used something like KO, real K theory. And they tried to carry out an atom spectral sequence type analysis for KO. Okay, and they got a fair ways, right? And they saw some interesting structure that you couldn't see otherwise. Uh, so it was partly successful, but the computations also get very complicated. Uh, and so it was, as I say, it was only partly successful. Some of that KO story is now being developed in the motivic context. So who is this? So Dominic Culver and JD Quigley and maybe some other people as well um, are, 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 are working on that sort of, 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 of thing. Okay. Mark Levine is saying that is Chow Witt is like a version of C2 Bredon cohomology. Yeah. Then I, I'm not really sure how Chow Witt fits into, uh, uh, fits into this. It's not something I've thought about. Okay. Um, the cohomology of a point, how does one go around these computations? Okay. So, um, oh, sorry, I'm jumping here. Wait, uh, mm -hmm. Let me, let me go in order. Can you explain what E1 and E2 definition are here? Is the spectral sequence defined in a different way to cohomology theory? Okay, so I think the question here with the, is with the atom spectral sequence, right? How is E1, how are E1 and E2 defined, okay? So E1 is defined simply by taking the homotopy of the homotopy groups of these third terms, right? Of these layers, okay? That's all it is, it's just that. That's the definition of the E1 term. Okay. And it turns out that we know what the homotopy of these guys are, and this has to, and, and it's expressible in terms of the Cobar complex. Okay, so there's two steps here. Formally, E1 is this, and then computationally, we know that this equals 
um, something in terms of a bar about the, of the, about the augmentation ideal of the dual steering algebra. Okay. Um, then uh, then the, the E2 page is defined to be the homology of the E1 page. There is a differential on the E1 page that goes from, um, from one term to the next. So here's how it goes. If you start with something like this, right? Remember, this is a cofiber sequence. Okay, so there is a map, there's a shift map, right? There's a boundary map from this guy it goes maps here. Let me draw it in color. There is a, a shift map that goes back there, right? It goes to the suspension of that thing, okay? And then, so you can, t you can apply that and then apply that map and you get a map from here to here. And the same thing from here, you have applied the, the boundary map and then down and so on and so forth. And that map, that's the D1, okay? So you, when you take the homology of E1 with respect to that differential, you get the E2 group, the E2, um, and that turns out to be X. And again, that's a computation, right? So formally, it's given by this composition, but it's a computation that it works out to be X over A. Okay, and then um, about the motivic cohomology point, how does one go about those computations? Okay, so the computing the motivic cohomology point is a very deep, very difficult problem, right? This is the Blockato conjecture, right? So Vavodsky did these computations, okay? Um, that is, I do not feel qualified to talk about the details of that, uh, sort of sort of thing uh, here. Uh, and so I'm not going to say anything about it. And it's certainly not something we're going to get into in any detail. However, let me foreshadow something that I'm going to say more about tomorrow. That in certain cases now, we have a kind of a way of working around all of the deep, difficult mathematics that Vavodsky did to compute the motivic steam run algebra and to compute the motivic cohomology of a point. Okay, so in certain cases, in particular, in C motivic homotopy theory, um, for the kinds of things that I do, we don't really need Vavodsky's computations anymore. We have another way of accessing the same results, okay, using deformations of homotopy theories. And I will specify a little bit more about that in, on Thursday's talk, in my second talk on Thursday. Okay, let's thank uh, the speaker again. And so, uh, well, uh, the next talk uh, is uh, in 90 minutes, maybe less, uh, by uh, uh, Tina Gerhardt at six o'clock uh, Paris time. Okay, um, I'm seeing a comment. I, I, I'm not in a hurry to stick around, uh, to, to leave, and this channel stays open, right? Yes, yes. Okay, um, <laughs> I'm seeing a comment. From, from Paul Arna that Sean means Milnervit motivic cohomology. So, right, so that makes a lot more sense to me. Um, I don't know, that's an intriguing idea. I don't know, I mean, I know of this Mo, Milnervit motivic cohomology. I don't know much about it, right? Tom Bachman, who was here, who may or may not be here right now, has been here sometimes this week, probably can tell us a lot more about that, right? Um, so that's an interesting question. Uh, my first question is what about the cooperations, right? What about, um, do we know anything about the operations in milner witt motivic cohomology? Uh, because uh, again, for explicit, comp that, that may or may not be the most important question for people who study milner witt motivic cohomology, but for the purposes of explicit computation, that would be kind of, you know, an important question, right? And I guess maybe the idea would be then the atom spectral sequence, you know, in this context, then completely captures Milner K theory, right? Um, something, something, something like that might, might be the way that that works out. I don't know, good question. Sounds like an, inter sounds like an interesting project. But I don't know enough to what to, I don't know, I don't know enough to assess whether it's realistic or not. I'm not saying it isn't, I just, I just don't know. Uh, then another uh, question from Andy Baker. Yeah, I see that. <laughs> yeah. All right. Uh, um, uh, I'm getting a question. Time? Sorry? Discussions time now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it, it's this is fine with you if I keep going, right? As long as there are questions, yeah, right? In fact, yeah. I'm, uh, I'm here during the day. Okay, the day great. Dinner. Okay, great. Um, uh, um, so, 
I think that the difference between nu bar and totus epsilon, right, is eta, is eta sigma, okay? And so eta sigma is a multiple of eta, and so it's in the indeterminacy. So the actual answer, Andy, is that it detects both of those. And um, there's, yeah, there's sort of, well, I could go on. I'm, I'm gonna, gonna restrain myself, right? Because I could start kind of like, I could, I could riff on this subject for a long time, right? But, but, um, but it's both because of that. And you have to straighten that. One of the tricky things you have to do in, in the eight and nine stem is you have to sort out the difference between them. And there's actually kind of some hidden structure there that you need to kind of be really careful about the difference between nu bar and, and, and epsilon. Um, and yeah, depending on how you look at it, you kind of see it in, in different ways. Is there a way that we can see the question? Yes, Sean, I think if you go in the Q&A and you click on answered, there's like a tab for open and a tab for answered. And the answered ones are there. Is there a way to detect the non-triviality of a given framed manifold? Um, right, so this question about frame manifolds goes back to like the early, early history of stable homotopy groups, right? There's this, this close connection between frame co-borders and frame manifolds and, um, and stable homotopy groups, right? And there was some work, I mean, I think maybe even like Pi 3, right? Classical Pi 3 maybe was even studied this way, right? Before it, it got to be sort of too, too uh, impractical. Um, so I think that in that range, you can be, you know, up to like Pi 3, say, I think you can be explicit about how stable homotopy elements interact with framed manifolds. And my understanding is that once you get beyond that, that things really break down, that you really can't, you know, people don't really know uh, how to sort of write things down in those terms. Um, in a motivic or equivariant context, I'm not even quite sure um, how that's gonna play out. Um, I mean, I guess there's a lot of recent work, right, about how framings relate to motivic stable homotopy, right? And that seems like kind of a promising direction. But, um, you know, again, because my sort of specialty, my interest is in explicit computations, I don't know to what extent that's um, uh, um, uh, I don't know to what extent that's kind of like you can you can do anything explicit. Although I don't know, maybe go back and look at the old you know work of, you know I don't know Rocklin and I forget um, there's another name associated with that that I'm drawing a blank on right now. But uh, go back and look at their old work and see whether they're um, uh, wh wh whether you can kind of come up with little algebraic versions of the kind of like the manifold constructions that those guys were those guys were studying. Okay, good. All right, there's a reference for um, milner witt based um, atom spectral sequence. That's, yeah, that's promising. Um, uh, equivariant motivic homotopy theory. I mean, so, you know, it, Inevitably, one is going to need to take equivariant motivic homotopy theory seriously, right? There is some work, I'm thinking of people like Ormsby, Heller, who and Kreish, right, and maybe others who have been sort of laying out foundations and some, you know, um, preliminary steps in the direction of equivariant motivic homotopy theory. Um, for sure, there are interesting things there. Um, I'd probably be doing it myself if I didn't have like a lifetime's worth of back backlog of other problems that I want to solve first. Um, I, I I think that's I think that's a great direction to go in. Um, the, I think the key idea about equivariant, in, the key idea is sort of like to choose the right kind of goal, right? What are you trying to do with equivariant motivic homotopy theory? Um, and one of the things I would like to understand to know more about, I think that we should know more about, is the is the quadratic construction in that in that context. But um, but anyway, but this is a wide open question. Um, so yeah, interesting stuff. The risk of asking a way to be.
Okay. I'm going to talk through this again. I'm happy to explain this again. Um, no, no, no problem. Okay. So these diagrams, okay, that you see on the left, they are not really kind of rigorous things. These are more like mnemonics, okay, tools to help us sort of like, you know, so we can communicate with other and we know what we're talking about without being, you know, super explicit. Okay. So the idea here is that you might want to construct a complex, okay, find a spectrum, okay, and that spectrum should have S mod beta, the two cell complex, as a subcomplex. So maybe I can write a little bit here, right? So we're looking for some, some complex X. It should have S mod beta, it should receive a map from S mod beta, and the quotient, the cofiber, should be some sphere. I'll just put an S star for a sphere, okay? That's one way of expressing the idea that, um, that S mod beta it can, is the bottom two cells, right? And then there's a third cell, S star, okay? And also, there should be a map from a sphere into X, and that, that this one corresponds to the bottom cell here, such that the quotient is the two cell complex, S mod alpha. Okay, you might ask for one X that has both of these properties. Okay, and it turns out that there, um, that such an S X exists if and only if alpha times beta equals zero. Okay, and then the same idea pertains here, maybe you know, I don't quite know what to call it. Maybe we'll call it S mod um, gamma comma beta. That's my name for the three cell complex. Okay, should map into X and the quotient should be a sphere. And then a sphere maps into X and the quotient should be S mod beta comma alpha. Okay, um, so that's a little more detail about exactly what this is. Now, what this means, right, is somehow even more complicated, right? But you can kind of break it down into what the parts mean, right? And those parts have to overlap consistently and so forth. All oh, right, and so I was so I sort of, sort of to finish this up here, I should say that one X exists if and only if alpha beta is zero, beta gamma is zero, and zero is in the bracket alpha comma beta comma gamma. Uh, and and so in what this the point here is that it's inevitable that you have to study total brackets. The total brackets just simply are the answers to the questions that um, that that we care about, and so we we need to study them. <laughs>